Welcome back, everybody. You might be able to tell by the sun on my face, it is morning now. We're back with a little bit more energy, and we are here at Chickamauga. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. I'm Gary Edelman. That's Chris White behind the camera there. And we have already spent a good deal of time on this battlefield exploring what happened on September 18th and on September 19th, 1863. On the 18th, the Confederates pushed against the bridges, eventually crossing Chickamauga Creek. On the 19th, there's going to be just terrible fighting all over the battlefield, but much much of it is going off over my right shoulder in those woods and way behind me down uh, the Lafayette Road here. And as the 20th comes on, the armies are assembled. James Longstreet is here in command. There's going to be a famous action going on more than a mile to the south here. But we're standing over near the visitor center. It is about uh, 400 yards behind the camera there. And there is a lot of important stuff happening on this part of the battlefield, namely a massive attack by John Cabell. Cable or Cabell Breckenridge. So to talk about that, let's bring on our friend, good, uh, our good friend Jim Ogden, historian, Chickamauga, Chattanooga, NMP. <laughs> good morning, Gary, Thank and you, I'm sir. glad you um, uh, did not um, emulate uh, William Rosecrans last night by uh, by pacing in the yard of headquarters um, until daylight. You got some sleep. That's so, actually uh, how I sleep, but good. different story. Oh, okay, so. <laughs> Well, um, good morning, everyone. And as Gary said, we are here on the, um, uh, on the, uh, the Union left um, on the morning of September the, the 20th. Um, overnight, uh, after a council of war at the Witta Glens, the uh, Union leadership, Rosecrans, Thomas, McCook, and Crittenden, had made the decision to stay and fight on this ground, but they would do so on the defensive, and they pulled back close to the corridor of the Lafayette Road. Um, and would continue to defend their route back to Chattanooga, this critical Lafayette Road, but um, they would do so from defensive positions that they would develop. And those positions had begun to develop even before dark on September the 19th and, and throughout now the night of um, the 19th and the early morning hours of the 20th. As dawn approaches, George Thomas is riding around here on the John McDonald farm looking at how to better protect the uh, Union left. He gets Rosecrans to come up here as well. They are making some adjustments. They're hoping to be able to extend the line further to the north to protect this vital road, the wartime road, back to McFarland Gap and Missionary Ridge, one of their potential ways off of the battlefield should they need to withdraw. Um, and James Negley's division is being moved up here, and some of you all will know the movement of Negley's division plays a role in the course of the action on the 20th associated with that gap that's going to be opened in the, uh, the Union line um, later in the morning. Um, these adjustments by the Union are being made um, at the, uh, the same time that they are expecting the Confederates to attack them at day dawn, the first bit of daylight. Um, but as the, as the light began to appear in the, uh, the forest that morning, there is no Confederate attack. Bragg and his um, uh, fractured um, uh, leadership um, uh, are not prepared to launch a day dawn in echelon by division from right to left attack as Bragg had, uh, had ordered. And in fact, it is going to be more than three hours after daylight before the first Confederate attack is launched. The orders have to be, the new or the day dawn attack orders have to filter down that new chain of command, as well as the order for the reorganization of the army. And the two divisions that were supposed to open the attack, the divisions of Daniel Harvey Hill's Corps of Bragg's Army, now subordinated to Leonidas Polk, the right wing commander. The Brett divisions of John Cable Breckenridge and Patrick Claiborne do not know of the, uh, the dawn attack orders. And when at dawn with no orders, the food for yesterday arrives, the order is feed the soldiers. And the men will begin to eat. And by the time they have consumed their rations for the 19th uh, and get formed up, more than three hours of daylight pass. But while the Confederate attack is more than three hours behind schedule, and the Federals have had now three hours of daylight to further strengthen their positions. When Breckinridge's division attacked, about 3,600 men under the command of that former Vice President of the United States, 
most of Breckenridge's division is deployed north of where the true Union left flank was, in the woods just to the southeast of where we are right now, to the southeast of the Kentucky Monument, the tall shaft you see along the Lafayette Road there, is the true left end of the Union line. Thomas was hoping to extend it further to, um, uh, to the north, but at the moment of the attack, the real left began there in that block of woods. And Breckenridge's brigades of Dan Adams, Louisianans and Alabamans, and Marcella Stovall, Floridians, North Carolinians, and Georgians, and half of the Kentucky Orphan Brigade under um, uh, Benjamin Harden Helm, when they attack, they come westward and actually reach and cross the Lafayette Road in this area, driving off the small part of Negley's division, John Beatty's brigade that was, uh, was here, um, uh, the uh, right half of Helm's brigade capturing the um, two guns of the uh, Bridges, Illinois battery, um, and then they turn south to move towards the true left end of the line. This attack, exactly what Rosecrans um, and Thomas and McCook and Crittenden feared might be the case. Um, uh, if the Confederates are successful here, they could cut the route to the, uh, for the Union Army back to Chattanooga. This um, attack puts tremendous stress on the leadership of the Army of the Cumberland, particularly the sleep-deprived William Stark Rosecrans. Um, and as Breckenridge's division, um, or the brigades of Adams and Stovall, drive towards, and for Stovall, even into the north end of the Kelly Field, the events begin to unfold associate it with the turning point of the battle, that um, movement of Woods Division and the, um, uh, the uh, attack by James Longstreet um, on the Brotherton Farm that we'll visit um, in a, um, a short time. But this pressure by, um, by Breckenridge is what is weighing on the, um, the, the, the sleep-deprived um, uh, William Stark Rosecrans as the morning progresses um, on September the 20th. Great, thanks Jim. This, what an extraordinary moment this is. I mean, just imagine that your lifeline toward Chattanooga um, you know, is in this direction. All of a sudden the Confederates, I mean, literally pour across this road and threaten your flank and threaten to cut you off. I wanna show you this visually a little bit here. You can see Breckenridge's soldiers lined up, clearly outlapping the Union line, and they are going into this field, and this is where we stand right now, and they are going to push down and get into the flank and rear of the Union Army. But you see that the Union is going to muster some reinforcements. Armies are durable things. It is not easy to destroy an army of 60,000 people, but before we bring Jim back on here, because I know he has more thoughts about this, um, you might wonder, you know, about this book. We've talked about it a little bit, Battle Maps of the Civil War. Some of you often write and say, hey, I want one of these hoodies, these preserve hoodies, or these cool windbreakers, or, excuse me, this didn't go as planned, a cool beanie, or a fleece, or otherwise, uh, cups, mugs, and whatnot. You can get all that at battlefields.org slash shop where, uh, you know, although there's some COVID issues with sizing, be patient with us. And we'd love if you could proudly wear uh, all of your American Battlefield Trust stuff. So thank you for enduring this commercial, everybody. Uh, back to you, Jim. <laughs> well, um, Breckenridge's um, uh, attack um, is, um, uh, will reach its high water mark at about um, 11. Um, the time of, of Rosecrans' fateful order to, um, to Thomas J. Wood is 10.45. Now, those times are uh, perhaps not exact. Um, there was no standard or centralized time or any um, uh, real source to, um, to regulate um, uh, clocks or watches by. Um, but uh, what it illustrates is just how critical this assault is. What we know today is being made by just a small Confederate division, but for Rosecrans, Ta and George Thomas in particular, they can, uh, can only assume that perhaps it is the very beginning of a major Confederate attack. Perhaps there was some mass formation in this area like what we'll, be, we'll see with Longstreet further south along the line. The Union line, as that had been formed overnight and in the early morning hours, was actually a line of lines, a defense in depth, multiple lines of troops. In fact, the Union Army, using Casey's tactics as their principal um, uh, uh, guidance for maneuver on the battlefields, 
Um, they um, have two, three, and even four lines of troops. And with the understanding by union leaders down the chain of command of the importance of maintaining this route back to Chattanooga, uh, you, the union response to this threat by Breckenridge is rapid. Um, by many leaders at different levels, even individual battery captains and com uh, commanders of regiments um, turning their troops from their reserve positions and into the effort to first stop and then throw Breckenridge's attack back. And not to give too much away, but Breckenridge's attack will be um, uh, uh, being repulsed at the very moment of the turning point on the battle um, further uh, south along this line that we'll see on the Brotherton Farm in just a little bit. But when you visit um, uh, Chickalaga and read about this um, battle, don't underestimate the importance of this attack on the morning of September the 20th. And so, Gary, I'll turn it back um, o over to you as we prepare to, uh, to move on in the, um, in the story. We'll kind of leave Breckenridge's men here in the height as we stand amongst the guns of the 5th Company of the Washington Artillery. Good, good. And as we stand among the guns, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Mikowski, Emerging Civil War. And, you know, this is a great spot on the battlefield, and, and the story that Jim's been telling us is kind of underappreciated because attention does turn to Longstreet's breakthrough and Snodgrass Hill and the Rock of Chickamauga. But this is important to understand that this is what makes those things happen. And it's a really easy spot to visit. The visitor center is just behind Chris White on the camera over there. We're here among the Washington Artillery, as Jim said, the Florida Monument just to the other side of the road. Beautiful monument, especially here at sunrise. We're getting a nice little backstop from the, uh, uh, the sun and the monument there and the Kentucky Memorial behind us there. And so this is a great spot to stop and visit. Um, understanding Breckenridge's role in this attack is really important too, because it is one of the most tantalizing what ifs of the of the entire battle. Um, because what if the attack had gone forward as it was supposed to earlier in the day? But understanding that that Breckenridge has only been with this army for about a month. He had been sent off to help Joe Johnson out around uh, Jackson and Vicksburg earlier in the summer. Before that, he'd been with this army and had a very tumultuous relationship uh, with Bragg that dates all the way back to Perryville. They had problems with Murfreesboro. Bragg has barely got his army under control because his whole high command is nearly mutinous. Add to that mix, let's bring in the very congenial, cordial, friendly D.H. Hill, who gets along with everybody. <laughs> and so he's now in the mix. And so if we look at where Breckenridge is in the organizational structure, he's one of two divisions underneath Hill who's underneath Polk. All of those guys get along with Bragg so well, don't they? And so we can see that the chemistry in the Confederate High Command is such that it's almost a preordained recipe for disaster. So we have to look at that context as we look at this attack and why it does or doesn't unfold the way it happens. But because it does unfold when it does, things in the southern end of the field are gonna turn extremely tumultuous for Bragg uh, and for Rosecrans. And this battle is gonna unfold as it has been for two days is going to unfold in unexpected ways. They're going to be fighting a battle that they didn't expect to be fighting in a way they haven't expected to fight it. We've been hearing about that this whole trip. We're going to find out more as we head further south down the field. I want to thank Jim for all his help. I want to thank Dr. Hodges, who's over here, giving us a little moral support and cheering us on. Chris White behind the camera, Gary Edelman, and you for allowing us to be here and sharing these fascinating stories. Thanks so much for all you do, and thanks for supporting Battlefield Preservation.
Welcome back, everybody. Man, we are getting tired, or at least I am, but we've been covering a lot here at Chickamauga. We've covered the 18th already, where there was fighting flaring at Reed's Bridge and Alexander's Bridge. We've covered it as the 19th uh, really saw the armies grow on the scene as they went toward the sound of the guns and sort of in the initial, uh, asp uh, initial parts of the battlefield on the north side. And then as the Confederates sort of swung around only to be stymied along the road you see off there in the distance, the Lafayette Road, okay? We talked about some of the fighting to the south in Vineyard Field. And now here we are getting ready to talk about what's gonna go on the 20th. And I think this, although maybe not the most costly and the roughest of the fighting at Chickamauga, it probably is the most famous of the fighting at Chickamauga. So we're gonna bring Jim Ogden back on here. We've got a lot to talk about. We've got a diversion error or, or uh, an intense attack on the Union left. Then we've got something going on in the center and we're gonna talk about that. Just to orient you here, we might overlay a map over this anyway. Um, a lot of the 19th fighting is up in here and then way down here. Um, the 18th fighting was sort of off the map over here. And then on the 20th, we're gonna be talking about a whole lot of more fighting there and then boom, right in the middle. Jim? Well, Gary, um, your um, observation about um, your own personal condition, being tired, um, is not inappropriate. In fact, I should call you um, General Edelman or, um, or General Rosecrans, um, because that plays a, um, a role in, um, in the story here. Um, but, um, uh, you know, as you note, um, kind of the, um, the, the highlight, uh, most well-known piece of the story, the deciding action of um, of the battle in so many ways is going to be um, what happens along the Union line here just a little bit to the right of center for the, uh, the Union Army um, in late morning of September the 20th. We're here on the Brotherton Farm. You can see the, uh, the cabin behind me that marks the, uh, the Brotherton Farmstead location. The Union line here was at the edge of the woods and a number of Union units had shifted in and out of this position throughout the, uh, the morning. Uh, William Stark Rosecrans had ridden by this, um, this area, in fact, not 90 minutes ago. Um, and the, um, uh, he has located his um, head headquarters or command post at the time about 800 yards to the west of where we are um, right now. And that is where Rosecrans is when he's dealing with the threat to the Union left, an attack by former Vice President of the United States, John Cable Breckinridge, um, which had kicked off hours late the Confederate attack on September the 20th. Um, and that threat to seemingly turning the Union left has caused Rosecrans to send reinforcements in that direction. And having been without much sleep in the last week, Rosecrans receives a message about the condition of his line just to the north of us the, on the Poe farm where Brannon's division was located that causes Rosecrans to believe that Brannon's division is out of line. And Brannon um, and Rosecrans orders the next division to the south, not going down the chain of command, but just sending an order directly to the commander of the division that was right here, commanded by Thomas John Wood. He orders Wood's division then of three brigades, one loaned to him from Van Cleve's division, and two of his own three brigades, Charles Harker's brigade and George Buell's brigade. He orders Wood's division to pull out and move north to close up on and support Joe Reynolds. Wood questions the validity of that, um, that order. His skirmishers are engaged with Confederates across the Lafayette Road in the woods, but Wood's immediate superior at that time, Alexander McCook, orders McCook to fire, or orders Wood to follow the order. And Wood pulls Barnes, Harker, and Buell's brigades out and starts them to the north, while McCook goes to get other troops to fill in Wood's position. I was just gonna add, okay, this happens in war a lot. What's the worst thing that could happen, Jim? Well, <laughs> unknown to Rosecrans, McCook, and Wood, um, although somewhat perhaps suspected by Wood because his skirmishers are heavily engaged, what turns out to be the power punch of the Confederate Army on September the 20th is located directly opposite of Wood's position. As you saw on the map that, um, that Gary um, used a few moments ago, this is now the Confederate left wing 
James Longstreet sector. He had been unable to get uh, five of his six divisions online side by side to one another and had wound up with a formation where he has three divisions across the front, each in two lines, and two other divisions in three more lines stacked behind that center division. And fearful that an order from Bragg, which has already sent his right front division into action, that Bragg's order might disorganize the remaining of the remainder of his formation. Um, about, about 11, he will order John Bell Hood, the commander of that three division column, eight brigades, five lines, 11,000 men, and the division to the left of, the, of, of it under um, Thomas Hindman. He will order those four divisions, 18,000 soldiers, to advance, um, and they will um, will move forward. The lead division, Bushrod Johnson's men, uh, advancing through the woods, driving wood skirmishers who remained in place back, crossing the Lafayette Road, and the Confederates will be surprised as anybody on the battlefield when, from here at the edge of the woods on the Brotherton Farm, they received no fire or hardly any fire whatsoever. And Bushrod Johnson's troops will pour through this gap that had just been opened in the line. McCook, trying to get troops to fill in the um, uh, in this position, um, had uh, not had enough time, um, and the Confederates will penetrate the line and the entire southern half of the Union line on the battlefield. That south of the Kelly Field, in just 60 minutes' time, will be put into a very fluid state, being driven off to the west. But as many of these Union troops are driven from their positions, they turn towards Chattanooga to the north. They know what the uh, goal and objective um, is, uh, and the, um, they begin withdrawing in that direction. And this begins that process of the Union Army being, able, or being pushed or being able to withdraw back into Chattanooga and not be cut off from Chattanooga as Bragg desired. This is what will bring Bragg a victory on the Chickamauga battlefield, but not the way he had intended, not with the Union Army being driven southward and crushed against the wall of Lookout Mountain. The battle turns here with the order issued by the sleep-deprived Union Army commander, William Stark Rosecrans, um, and the, um, uh, the fortuitous attack by that three-division column of James Longstreet. Good. Who's yeah. coming? Earlier in the day, or earlier, had not Wood received a profanity-laced tirade from Rosecrans for a failure to, to obey some of his orders. Well, so what was his mindset after this profanity-laced tirade earlier? Well, um, uh, Wood himself will, um, will later say that, um, that whatever that interaction, whether it was a profanity-laced tirade um, by Rosecrans or just a chewing out, um, that that um, interaction did not um, uh, really affect his, um, his mindset. And in fact, he actually will consult the man who is responsible for this sector of the line when he received Rosecrans' order, Alexander McCook. And McCook said, follow the order. I'll take care of getting some of Davis's and Sheridan's troops to take your place. Um, Wood will maintain that that interaction with Rosecrans did not color his spirit. But that story will, will live on, promoted by Rosecrans partisans in the post-battle and post-war period, trying to explain away Rosecrans' bad day on a battlefield that really, in many ways, begins the exit of William Stark Rosecrans from the pages of the Civil War history books. And I'll point out, Thomas Crittenden is painted with a bad brush as a result of this, too. He'll be exonerated, and I gotta work him in here because when my pal Thomas Greeley Stevenson is killed at the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse on May 10th, 1864, Crittenden will be uh, put in charge there of that division for the Ninth Corps. And he'll go on to uh, just a little bit of success and then finally uh, resign from a bad case of nerves. Now, Jim, I wanna ask you, um, Longstreet, who's a name that draws ire from folks who are fans of Gettysburg, but uh, Chris White behind the camera, he and I affectionately call him Jimmy. Um, he stumbles into an opportunity here, but he makes the most of it. And we see Longstreet uh, often thought of as a defensive commander, 
really has some of his best days on the offense. We see that here. Well, and we see that at Second Manassas and also the um, the wilderness. Um, Longstreet leads some of the biggest Confederate attacks of the um, of the war. Um, and in fact, his attack here, if it had been in Longstreet's mind or Longstreet's um, control totally, would have been even larger than it was. He, um, recognizing that the Confederate attacks for the day had gotten um, started very late, he figured as a wing commander, he had authority to make a modification within his wing, and he had intended to send um, uh, all three of his frontline divisions um, and one other division forward at a single time, and then fortuitously for Longstreet, uh, part of McLaws' division arrives as well, two, br two brigades, and he is able to use them. But he actually was intended a larger attack if Bragg had not intervened with um, his order to Stewart's division. And that's gonna foreshadow some problems for this army that are gonna last for months as Bragg and Longstreet. Uh, Longstreet brings much needed reinforcements and he brings an armchair general's mentality. <laughs> Let me bring Gary back on here as we start to wrap things up here. Yeah, no, not start to. I am tired. We're wrapping this thing up right now. All uh, right, General you know, Rose Franz. Yeah. Thank so you, sir. At least you recognize the need for sleep. Yes, yes I which do Which is indeed. one of the important lessons to take from this um, uh, situation. And one thing I have learned is when I'm tired, it brings me to about where the people around me usually are in terms of their energy level. So there you have it. The most fortuitous attack of the Civil War, if you ask me, the turning point point of the Battle of Chickamauga, and we're leading toward that climax on the 20th. I would estimate that it's probably already the most costly battle ever fought in the Western theater, and there's still the bloody climax to go. So we're going to cover that on another video. I really appreciate everybody's help today. Uh, Jim, Anthony, Chris White behind the camera doing yeoman service on other duty that you'll learn about before long, and Chris Mikowski and all y'all for supporting us coming out here and for supporting battlefield preservation and education. <laughs>